All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are going to be starting here in a couple minutes. Up to you guys join online. Thank you. I'm just going to give everyone here a minute or two to sit down and we'll get started. Oops. Hit the wrong button here. Used to, good morning, everybody. I'm not as comfortable with this hybrid thing. I'm really good at online or uh, in person, but both it's a little bit, it's not as good as peanut butter and chocolate. It's a little harder. So anyways, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our final um, of the year agribusiness forum. Let me just take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Todd Underwood. I am the strategic marketing manager at SIFT. Um, and really happy to have you here. Um, just so you know, for those of you joining online, if you have any questions, you can put those in the Q&A function. And uh, anybody in the audience will hold questions till the end and we'll, you'll have plenty of time to ask. Um, I think everybody here, I've no, I recognize we're gonna have some people online who are new. So let me just take a few moments to tell you a little bit about SIFT and what we do here. Um, we are part of the Ohio MEP, which is a nationwide public-private partnership with centers in all 50 states, as well as Puerto Rico. We are dedicated to serving small and medium-sized manufacturers. Um, SIFT is one of six centers in uh, of center affiliates in the state of Ohio. We have a vision to be partners in solutions and innovation for food and manufacturing um, and agribusiness, I apologize. We work to achieve this uh, vision with a unique blend of offering direct services, as well as a vast network of resources and other partnerships throughout the state. Our goal is to increase competitiveness and growth in Northwest Ohio and throughout the state. We have a particular focus on the food industry. Um, this agribusiness forum kind of helps us complete this mission by highlighting trends, new information in those spaces. And we meet once a month. And as I said, this is our, our last one of the year, which is kind of sad, but um, means the holidays are coming. And uh, it's really nice to see so many people in person because for a long time we were doing these only virtually. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Terry Mesher from the Ohio Department of Agricultural Division and Soil Conservation. Uh, Terry serves as the program director of H2O. Uh, let me see, and before this, let me see, there seems to be a problem online, let me. Come on up, Terry. I'll get you started here. All right, let me share screen. Share. All right. There we go. It should be good to go. I may have to bump up if I hear anything. Okay, please. All right. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Mesher. I'm, as Todd said, with the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm the director for the H2 Ohio program for the Department of Agriculture. So, um, H2 Ohio, what is it? Um, let me skip a few of these slides because since we're in the Bowling Green Toledo area, I'm assuming that uh, you folks generally know the, the history of driving it, but H2 Ohio is a water quality program um, that was initiated by Mike DeWine actually back in 2019, um, fiscal year 2020. 
Um, and really the, the, the overall, the overarching goal of the program is to improve water quality across the state. Um, it is a statewide program. Um, and that's, that program is being managed and delivered to the public through three departments of the state of Ohio. The Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, if we look at overall, the overall program funding um, at this point in time is somewhere around, uh, I think it's around $85 million a year, which is, is, is really an incredible effort. Um, I am not aware of, of any conservation effort that is state funded that rivals what Ohio is trying to do on the water quality front. Um, so this is being driven by some of the water quality concerns overall in uh, Lake Erie with the algae blooms. Um, and just to set up kind of where we're at from the Department of Agriculture, wanted to go through and, and look at some of the some of the causes with the algae blooms and kind of where we're at. Um, the main focus, what we're doing with H2 Ohio is trying to reduce the overall phosphorus loading going into Lake Erie from the Maumee and from the Western Lake Erie Basin. And if we look at historically, um, <clears throat> we've done a good job historically of trying to reduce those overall phosphorus flows. If you look at back at, I got a little red arrow there in 1972. 1972 is when the Clean Water Act was passed. That's what formed the U.S. Department of, or the, the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And really we've been concentrating on reducing phosphorus loading ever since then from a water quality standpoint. Um, if you look at the lines here overall, for the first 20 to 25 years, U.S. EPA was focused primarily on point sources. Point sources would be municipal, municipal water treatment, wastewater treatment plants, um, industry, and looking at point sources where you had a pipe that was discharging pollutants into a stream, into a body of water. And as the science, as the understanding of, of water quality has developed, Ohio EPA, U.S. EPA have, have continuously ratcheted down the allowable phosphorus dis discharges from these point sources, whether it be industry, whether it be municipalities, what have you. And there's still work being done there. But as you can see on the graph, over time, that red line has shrunk down quite a bit. And for the most part, when we look at total phosphorus loading, if, if the red line here is pretty much our goal, in a lot of places we're meeting it. So we were doing a good job there, however, if we look at dissolved reactive phosphorus, phosphorus doesn't like to be dissolved in water. It would rather be attached to something. And if we look at the dissolved, uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus within the water column, since about the mid 90s, early 90s, mid 90s, that number overall has been trending up. Um, this chart goes out to about 2000, uh, 2011. If we look at the data from 2015 on, it seems to have pretty much leveled out. But something happened in the mid 90s to cause that inflection. Now, why is the dissolved reactive phosphorus so much more important? It's because it's completely bioavailable. It's the way I think of it, it's it's basically jet fuel for plants. And as soon as it gets in a water column, it's available for algae to take up and grow. And in general, um, the amount of phosphorus in the water column will dictate the amount or the size of the algae bloom that we're dealing with in whatever body of water that we have. Um, and algae blooms are not just a Lake Erie problem. Um, we've been dealing with algae blooms for many, many years in Grand Lake St. Mary's. In 2016, is there any guesses where the largest algae bloom in Ohio was? It was, late. It was actually the Ohio River. The Ohio River had an algae bloom that went almost from Wheeling, West Virginia, nearly to Cincinnati. So, you know, it, it, it's, it affects everything. Typically lakes more than rivers because algae loves to have sun and warm water. Usually our rivers are a little more shaded and cooler water. So, but that's overall, our goal for the program is trying to reduce the phosphorus load going down into Lake Erie. So let's, let's look a little bit about Lake Erie specifically and, and what some of the, the phosphorus reduction goals are. Um, in 2015, um, an international group together got an international group got together and started looking at Lake Erie and started to devising a way 
to significantly reduce the, the occurrence of algae blooms within the lake. And where they settled at was if they used 2008 as a baseline and said, if we reduce that load going into Lake Erie through the Western Lake Erie Basin by 40%, we will take the algae blooms that we've been experiencing and make them insignificant nine out of 10 years. Not a perfect system. We're not going for a perfect system. We recognize that algae blooms will be there. At the end of the day, rainfall precipitation is the biggest driver in this overall system. So we're not shooting for a perfect system here. We're shooting for an uh, insignificant bloom nine out of 10 years. So if we're gonna do a 40% phosphorus reduction, we need to understand the baseline. Um, Ohio's baseline load is about 2.5 million pounds of phosphorus annually that's going into Lake Erie. If we wanna do a 40% reduction, that's roughly about a million pounds of reduction every year. And if we look at what I concentrate on, the non-point source is the agricultural landscape. We're trying to get about an 800,000 pound reduction annually. So, and this is not, this is a little bit tougher concept, but this isn't like we're, we're taking donations at the, at the volunteer fire department. We see the thermometer go off. Um, every time we turn in to January 1, that reduction number goes back to zero. So we've really got to look at long-term management goals that are gonna to lead to reducing the overall loads. And that's what we're concentrating on with, with, the, uh, with the H2 Ohio program. And how, how is the ODA, how's the Department of Agriculture looking at it? We're focusing on reducing the nutrient losses through basically three different focus areas. Better nutrient management, so we wanna challenge uh, the nutrients, the fertilizers, the manure that's spread out there on the on the agricultural cropland, and make sure that if that phosphorus application isn't needed, if that nitrogen application isn't needed for crop production, that we eliminate it. Um, number two, better erosion management. We have done a fantastic job in Northwest Ohio over the last 30, 35 years of really reducing sediment loads going into uh, Lake Erie. I think if I remember Laura Johnson's numbers correctly, we've overall load reduction of sediment over the last 30 years, we probably dropped it somewhere in the range of 30 to 35%, if I, if I remember the numbers right. So we've done a fantastic job of reducing the overall sediment load, but there's more, there's more we can do there. And then lastly, water management. If we look at just um, increased rainfall and increased precipitation from the Western Lake Erie Basin, um, we've seen about a 35% increase in overall runoff coming out of the Maumee River Basin over the last 30 years. Um, part of that is driven by um, increased rainfalls. Um, not going to get into the debate about climate change, all those things. But if we look at average rainfall for the western parts of Ohio, the 30-year average rainfall in 1985 for the biggest swath of western Ohio was somewhere around 37 or 38 inches per year. If I go back and look at <clears throat> Dayton, Ohio, and we look backwards in time from 19, uh, I'm sorry, from the year uh, 2020, back 30 years, the average rainfall, annual rainfall for that past 30 years is somewhere closer to 43. So we've seen an increase of about six or seven inches of precipitation average. That's not just one year, that's the average over that time. And the increase in rainfall that delivered more than two inches, uh, we've, we've got about three times the number of rainfalls today that deliver um, two inches or more annually than we did back in uh, 1985. So there's a whole lot of different things going on in the system. Water management is going to end up being uh, an important one because at the end of the day, to take anything from the landscape and bring it to Lake Erie, it takes energy. And the energy we got driving that system is the precipitation and the rainfall. So if we can hold water back a little bit, slow it down, let things settle out, that in and of itself is going to help us reduce sediment loads and also reduce the nutrient load. So those are the three areas that we're concentrating on. Um, if we look at our program area or our project area, we initially started the program rollout in 14 counties. And these are the 14 counties. It's a little bit faded out here, but the 14 counties that are in green here, 
Um, that represents the vast majority of the Western or the, the Maumee River watershed. Um, and that was our target first. We rolled that program out in uh, February of 2020. We had overwhelming interest in the program and then COVID hit. So that kind of uh, threw a little bit of a monkey wrench in our plans, but um, we were able to continue with the program instead of offering practices and, and, and funding practices for the 2020 crop year. We scrapped, scratched the 2020 crop year and we started delivering our first um, practices uh, on the field in 2021. And then in the fall of 2021 and into early uh, winter of 2022, we expanded our project area to include the counties there in the yellowish color, the 10 additional counties. Um, the reason for those counties is any producer, any agricultural producer that's in the state of Ohio that is farming ground within the Western Lake Erie Basin has an opportunity to participate in the program. We decided early on that delivering the program at the county basis was a much more effective way to deliver the, the program. Um, if we deliver it on a watershed basis, we get down into the discussion of, is this farm in the watershed? Is it not? Is this field in the watershed or is it not? Is this part of the field in the watershed or is it not? And in order just to have a consistent message going out to producers, we decided to deliver it at the county level, which has worked really well so far. Currently, we're in 24 counties across Northwest Ohio, and um, we have uh, existing contracts um, that extend out to uh, uh, that uh, fund practices through 2023 in the original 14 counties and through 2025 in the uh, in the additional 10 counties. Um, so what are we looking at for our practices? Um, the foundation of the program is a, what we call a voluntary nutrient management plan. Uh, the voluntary nutrient management plan is defined in Ohio Revised Code. Um, it was part of uh, Senate Bill, gosh, I can't remember this. Senate Bill 150 is what it was. And Senate Bill 150 was in response to some of the nutrient management concerns uh, with Western Lake Erie Basin, which basically said, hey, if you're if you're applying fertilizer, you have to have uh, some sort of educational program that goes along with it. Much like the uh, pesticide applicator program, uh, that program is managed through extension. But the voluntary nutrient management plan essentially is the foundation of the program. Everything that we do within the program has to be in accordance in accordance with that plan. And I'll go through what the voluntary nutrient management plan is here in a little bit. Then we're looking at um, these first ones that are in yellow, better nutrient management. So. The first thing we want to do is reduce nutrient loading by better nutrient management. You know, let's put the fertilizer where it's needed to produce the crops. Let's avoid putting fertilizer where it's not needed. Um, and that includes both commercial fertilizers and mineral. And then we're also concentrating on reducing erosion. <laughs> so, so those are the practices that we're offering now, which include uh, some subsurface placement, manure incorporation, some some conservation or some cover crops and conservation mm -hmm. crop rotation. Essentially, these two practices establish cover in the wintertime to protect the soil surface and to, to encourage more infiltration of the water. And we are working in the drainage water management field. However, um, I, I think it was probably uh, as we move the program forward, we're going to pull the drainage water management out because that's the only structural practice we have and probably handle that through a separate sign up or a separate program. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of an odd duck in there. It's the only structural practice that we have in the program. It requires engineering plans and some other evaluation that that kind of separated out. So, but we have had a lot of success not only in H two Ohio but in previous programs about getting some drainage water management uh, structures in there. So, for the voluntary nutrient management plan. What are we looking at? The goal, as I said, is, is to reduce phosphorus losses. But really, what we're looking at is is we're trying to take the current soil test. So looking at the soil and what's the nutrient, the nutrient um, uh, content of that soil and match that up with the crop rotation. So we got the current soil tests and the soil tests for program rules have to be less than four years old. Um, and then look at your crop rotation and the yield. Use those two pieces of information to develop a nutrient rec recommendation for the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium fertilizers that come into the field. Every time we, if we want to produce any kind of a crop, whether it be tomatoes, peppers, corn, beans, wheat, 
you're going to need some nitrogen, you're going to need some phosphorus, you're going to need potassium to come into the system. So to develop this nutrient recommendation, we're referring to the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide. The Tri-State Fertilizer Guide is a guide that was put together by Ohio State University, Purdue, and Michigan State. Um, those three universities got together back in the 90s and developed a coordinated recommendation scheme for uh, developing nutrient recommendations. The original one was published in 1995. Um, Ohio State, the three got together again. They, they um, updated that guide in 2020. So we're now translating into the 2020 uh, Tri-State Fertilizer Guide. And I also have NRCS 590. NRCS 590 is essentially the part you know, everything with commercial fertilizer that, that NRCS uh, or the 590 standard contemplates defers back to the uh, Tri-State Fertilizer Guide. 590 also gives us information guidance on how to handle manures and how to apply manures and how to develop those application rates. So within our nutrient management plan, we develop the nutrient recommendations. Then we start to decide, okay, what kind of products are we going to use to satisfy those? We can't get uh, we can't get 100% phosphorus fertilizer. It's not out there. So we got to develop products that are going to meet those nutrient needs and ultimately guide it into a nutrient application. And for our for our folks that are enrolled in H2 Ohio, the producer develops the plan, submits it to the local soil and water conservation district. The district looks it over, reviews it, makes sure that it matches up with the recommendations and the requirements of both the, the 590 standard and tri-state fertilizer guide. If it does, they go ahead and prove it. If it does not, they send it back to the producer and say, you gotta make some edits here to get this plan in shape. Within H2 Ohio, we're paying producers to develop this plan, not only develop this plan, but ensuing years then to follow the plan and implement it and document, show us that they've implemented the plan. So this is where we're trying to criticize some of those unneeded phosphorus applications and nitrogen applications, to be perfectly honest. And again, when I say unneeded, we want to maximize the, the, the crop production that's out there. We do not want to harm crop production. After all, at the end of the day, tax, tax money pays my salary. The agricultural industry is the largest single industry in Ohio. So we don't want to damage that overall economic engine. We want to make it more efficient. So that's, that's our goals within that. Um, through the nutrient application practices, again, we're trying to reduce losses by improving the application method and time. Um, one of the biggest drivers of the summer algal blooms in Lake Erie is the amount of phosphorus that enters the lake from about the middle of March to about the middle of July. And there's some debate over what the most important period is there. It's whether it's gonna depend on the individual year. So what we're trying to do within within our application practices is to change up the timing so that it's less likely to end up in that spring load and also um, improve the overall application method. So um, that phosphorus that we put out there in a the commercial fertilizer is less likely to run off the surface and down through um, into the waterways. Um, so what we're looking at with that is uh, a precision application. So we're putting those fertilizers where they're needed within the field, not, uh, not just a flat rate across the entire field. Um, manure incorporation, where we try to get that manure worked into the soil instead of leaving it on the surface. And lastly, placement, where we're trying to, this is one of our placement toolbars, where we're taking that fertilizer directly from the tank, from the fertilizer buggy, and putting it right in to the ground. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is, is that with increased conservation tillage and with increased no-till that's happening across the basin, across the state of Ohio, and with improving soil health, what we end up with is we end up with more macro pores that go directly from the surface into our subsurface tile or into a, a gravel zone or something like that. We have much better connection today from the surface into the drainage system than we did in 85 when we had a whole lot more plowing going on. Because every year if we had a plow, if we had that with that tillage, we had a mechanical disruption of all of those connections from the surface to the drainage network. So, you know, you can't change anything in a system without something else changing somewhere else. Yeah, um, for manures or for, for, that's where we're focusing in on is strip tillage 
in all honesty, strip tillage and then trying to satisfy uh, crop phosphorus needs possibly through the planter or through side dress when we're talking about corn. Um, but we're talking about direct injection. We're not doing any incorporation of our fertilizers. Um, we would contemplate that. We'd love to contemplate that solely with manure, but the technology to do that with manure just isn't out there. So, um, and, and to be perfectly honest, um, if we start to look at the, the overall nutrient application and the volumes of some of our liquid manures to satisfy nutrient applications, we need to, we need to take that soil and open it up so that it can absorb some of that liquid manure that comes with it. But for, for our phosphorus placement, for our commercial fertilizers, we aren't looking at broadcast application and, and incorporation. We're looking strictly at placement. So it goes from the buggy, from the tender, directly into the ground through strip tillage, through some sort of application bar. Ideally, the horsepower and the, the energy that it takes to place fertilizer, we'd like to take advantage of operations that are already going in the field, strip tillage, planting, and then side dress where we bring our nitrogen into the, into the corn crop. Any other questions? I guess I have a question on the application. It just seems to me that the sophistication of application and all the technology that it's going into it now, Rose has plans and she needs me and AI Tech. And I mean, this is all playing in for the placement, but, but the implement companies have to keep, you know, inventing more better application. Well, what, what, and I, I think, you know, for, for our purposes, and, and it's probably taken me probably a year and a half or two years too late coming to this conclusion, but after after the last two years and, and the experience that ODA, that our division has gained within this program, I would say you're exactly right. But I think as we look at H2 Ohio, I see us challenging the industry a little bit more. And I, I think as we look at it, um, ODA is going to fund work to try to challenge some of our recommended phosphorus soil test levels that are out there. I, I think, me personally, from what I've seen thus far, I think we can we can probably reduce those phosphorus levels a little bit without sacrificing yield. If we reduce those phosphorus levels overall, we're gonna see less discharge or less leaching of phosphorus into the water. So that's number one. And number two, I think we gotta be a little bit creative on how we look at it. Um, placement of fertilizer takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy. Um, you know, if we look at a broadcast fertilizer application, um, I, I'm going to be way off on the numbers because I'm not in the industry. But, you know, if we look at broadcast fertilizer buggies, they can cover tens of acres in an hour fairly easily. Um, and that buggy, that piece of equipment can get across four or five hundred acres in a day really, really easily. If we start to look at placement, that efficiency isn't there. And that's where I think when we look at placement, we, ODA, working with Ohio State, other research institutions, and the industry have to figure out different ways to do that fertilizer application within existing field operations. Um, one of the folks that we're working with now is looking at older air drills that are 30 or 40 feet wide and putting a fertilizer tank on there and using that air drill to deliver fertilizer. But Fertilizer is a lot more corrosive than what seed is. So there's a whole lot of other parts of that machinery that have to be robust enough to resist that corrosion. So it's a work in progress and we're getting there, but it is, it's, it's very high tech and it gets really high tech really quick with, with the advance that we've seen in, in technology, um, satellite communications, GPS, agriculture is at the forefront of that. Agriculture was some of the first industry to start putting GPS equipment into individually owned equipment. It came with yield monitors and some of those sort of things back in the late 80s and early 90s. So, but you are right. There's, there is a challenge on the equipment side. Um, for erosion reduction, um, our biggest seller in all honesty within the program is probably overwintering cover crops. Uh, I think we have always been challenged and when I say we, the division of soil and water, it's really hard just to pencil out cover crops. There's no sale that goes as long with that. So the advantages of a cover crop are hidden in other cost savings that are a little bit tougher to draw out in the overall crop management or the crop budget. But we do have growing interest in the cover crops, um, as well as what we call conservation crop rotation, that'd be the small grains. 
uh, small winter annuals, whether that be rye or wheat or barley, incentivizing the uh, planting of that or, or the forages. And again, all of these provide some sort of soil cover um, throughout the winter. Um, Northwest Ohio, it's really hard to get a really good cover crop going into the winter freeze. Um, but I think we're also starting to learn that with the first stalls that we have in the spring, late February, early March, even if that cover crop didn't green up in the spring, we see a robust growth in the, in the, in the if it didn't green up in the winter, my apologies, or prior to winter, we see a pretty robust growth very early in the spring. So we do think it affords us quite a bit of an advantage uh, with that. And again, all of these, the science and the understanding of how they work from a water quality standpoint, it's still underway. So um, I did talk a little bit about drainage water management structures. Um, through the program, we've signed up over 700 drainage water management structures across those 24 counties. Um, prior to H2 Ohio, um, our division funded through some, through some uh, federal funds, over the installation of over 1,200 water control structures in 2015, 16, and 17. So we've, we've had a lot there. Um, so we're getting those installed as well. ODNR, I was talking to one gentleman who's put in a wetland with ODNR. Um, ODNR's piece of H2 Ohio is they're putting additional incentives on wetland construction um, for, for landowners um, across some of their state-owned ground and, and for other conservation institutions. And again, from the wetland side of it, that's the ability to take that water, slow it down, and give that give that biology uh, a chance to process some of those nutrients that are coming through. I think, me personally, I think long-term, um, what H2 Ohio and what this nutrient reduction effort will turn into and eventually evolve into will be some sort of water management across the rural landscape. If we look at what's happened in municipalities since the, since the early 80s till today, we're looking at a whole lot more water management infrastructure. We're looking at stormwater retention and detention. We're looking at some of those sort of things. With, with our changing rainfall and the intensity of the rainfalls, I think we're gonna land on a lot more focus on wetlands and different structures to try to slow the water up, hold it up and release it more slowly. So wait, to, it's, it's to be seen yet, but I think, I think the science is gonna take us there ultimately. Um, what's the program interest been? Um, what you see in front of you there is uh, to say that interest has exceeded expectations is probably an understatement. The, the chart that you see, the graph here, is the percentage of cropland that we have um, an approved voluntary nutrient management plan that's been developed in 21 or 22. So uh, if we look at Williams County, 31% of all the cropland in Williams County currently has an approved voluntary nutrient management plan in it. Um, our stars, Henry County, 63%, Erie County, 74%. Um, it's, it's the overall interest in the program has been fantastic. Um, it's been overwhelming. We haven't had the capacity within the soil water districts to match up and to keep up with demand, to be perfectly honest. That's, that's one of our failings that ODA has been not anticipating the, the interest, number one, and not understanding the workload um, that we were creating when we started to roll out this program. If we look at some statistics overall, um, <clears throat> across our 24 counties, we have about 1.6 million acres of cropland enrolled. Is that percentage based on acreage or um, producer? That's acreage. That's cropland acres. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's cropland acres. So, <laughs> in the, I kind of laugh at it now. I, I think in, uh, in May and June of, of 2020, when we were all sitting at home wondering what COVID was going to bring <laughs> us, I was I was sweating bullets because at the time we had $180 million worth of interest in the program and we had about $25 million worth of funds to try to stretch out. And we didn't have a way to prioritize one application over another. So um, to say that the interest is, is overwhelming is, is an understatement. Um, but right now we've got about 1.6 million acres um, uh, in approved VNMPs. To take that 24, just for reference, that 24 county area, that project area, the overall cropland within that project area is somewhere around 4.3 million acres. So we've got 
roughly just a little bit over a third of the all cropland enrolled in H2 Ohio at this point in time. So if you're running down the county highways or the Interstate 75 through those areas, three to four out of every 10 fields you look at are enrolled in H2 Ohio and have a nutrient management plan that's been reviewed and approved um, through the local soil and water district. Uh, we have 800,000 acres in precision uh, application, 350,000 acres in placement, um, nearly 200,000 acres in manure incorporation. And that um, is a small number relative to the 1.6 million acres. But if we look at manure generated in the watershed, and we look at the overall nutrient content of that, if we can achieve 200,000 acres of manure incorporation, that's the majority of the manure that's that's produced within the watershed. So that's that's huge. That's there's 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 a limit, an upper limit on what that number can be, and um, um, that's a significant part of the manure that's generated in the watershed. And nearly got a typo there. Nearly 625,000 acres in cover crops. So again, we've we've had overwhelming interest in the program. Um, go ahead. Will do. Thank you. Uh, the question was, is of the 200,000 acres of manure incorporation, how much is variable rate um, technology? We can. Um, we've had a lot of interest in doing that. The reality is, while the capacity to do variable rate manure application is out there, it's not all that effective at this point in time. And, and the main reason for that is the vast majority of our manure is on liquids and the technology to truly do variable rate liquid manure application in a commercial sense, it's just not there yet. Um, to control flow, that's coming out of the pump from the from the liquid holding pond that's coming in at 800 or 900 or 1,000 gallons per minute or more and start to adjust that flow very effectively, it, it gets very difficult because you've got a lot of momentum. And for those of you that are in water distribution for municipalities, water hammer and some of those sort of things become a realistic issue in that. So the technology is developing, but to say that the, the precision part of manure application is significant at this point, I'd say it's not. But the way we're tracking that in all honesty is, is we're, we're looking at the overlap between precision applications and manure incorporation on the same property. So because we're not applying, we're not allowing within the program the application of commercial fertilizers and manure on the same acre in the same year. So we can differentiate between those two and we can evaluate that. Um, what we've looked at so far, it's not been significant. Um, I said this a little bit earlier, um, and this is a little bit of a repeat, but all the nutrient application practices that we're doing have to be in accordance with the nutrient management plan. So for me as a producer coming into H2 Ohio, I, the, my first step is to develop the uh, nutrient management plan. And if I've got a field that has sufficient phosphorus levels in it, such that tri-state fertilizer guide says, I, there is no phosphorus recommendation on this field, then I can't apply for, for phosphorus placement or for manure incorporation on that field. Because again, we want to be critical of those nutrient applications and we want to incentivize the applications that are necessary, but not the ones that aren't necessary for crop production. So those are some of the things that as we go through the first couple of years of the program have provided an educational opportunity between the Soil and Water Conservation District and the producers to really have that discussion of whether or not that phosphorus is needed. So. It's been a learning curve on all sides. Um, and then the remaining practices support that, the nutrient management plan in an effort to reduce load and overall erosion. Um, we went through these, um, the manure incorporation, I think really within, if you look at the program and if you look at the, the operation for a livestock facility, somebody that's producing livestock, um, many times those producers don't need additional phosphorus or potassium coming into their farm. <laughs> Typically, they've got more than enough phosphorus and potassium coming in with the manure from their livestock. So when we look at that, we did a couple things. 
is we fashioned our, our practices to focus in on using the nitrogen that's in that manure as a nitrogen source for corn, number one. Number two, we've taken, taken those, those soil test limits and we've matched them up with fertilizer. So um, if, if I've got a, a field that's already got sufficient phosphorus in it, I'm not gonna get paid to do manure incorporation on that field. However, my neighbor can apply for that practice and he can receive the, the incentive to apply that manure on ground that could use that phosphorus in a better situation, that's lower soil test phosphorus. The reason why we did that is as we looked at the overall situation, our assumption, and I think it's a good assumption, is that the manure that's generated in the, in the, uh, in the watershed will be used in the watershed. It's already here. If we look at our commercial fertilizers, the commercial fertilizers we're bringing into the US or into Ohio, I should say, are either coming out of Florida, they're coming out of Canada, or coming somewhere from Europe. So if we can take the manure that's already in the watershed that will already be applied here and replace commercial fertilizer that's going to be imported, overall, we're reducing the amount of phosphorus that's being brought into the system. It's not going to be an immediate reaction, not going to be an immediate impact, but it's going to start taking us in the right direction. Um, if we look at the two different project areas, we kind of went through some of this stuff. I think the most impressive thing for this with me is the number of contracts that we have. Um, it's the, actually the number of the contracts that I'm quoting here, but I correlate that to the number of individual producers that we're in contact with. Um, across the 24 county area, we've got a little over 2,400 producers that we're working with. Uh, we've got some soil and water districts. Putnam County, I think, has over 300 active contracts. Um, in their in their office. Um, when I talked to Bob George at Henry Soil and Water, he is, Bob George has worked at Henry Soil and Water for 25 years, maybe more. Um, he said with this program, he's seen faces walk through that door that he's never seen before. So we're getting a lot wider range of folks that we're working with. Um, and it's, it's, it's been a workload. Um, it's been a huge workload for us. Um, if we look at it, um, I've gone through some of these numbers. Uh, I think the most important thing for me in looking at these conservation programs, it's an educational effort, number one. And number two, uh, the reality is, is at the end of the day, economics are going to drive the overall system. And, you know, from a water quality standpoint, um, we have to recognize that some of these practices that we're doing are awful difficult to pencil out from a, from a dollars and cents point, standpoint. Cover crops, I talked about cover crops. Cover crops in and of themselves, if you try to pencil that out on the overall budget, it's almost impossible to do. So there are some of these practices that producers are interested in doing, but there is an overall cost to the system, overall cost to the operation. And I think what my goal is and the way I'm looking at this, this is an educational effort um, from ODA. We're working on understanding the economics of some of these practices better. Um, and then hopefully in time, we can show the economic benefit of bringing those practices in is really how I'm looking at it. Um, we do have all this data available online or it will be online soon. Um, the state of Ohio through the Innovate Ohio platform is developing what they call dashboards. And within those dashboards, um, all the H2 Ohio enrollment for the individual practices will be available by county. Um, and I think by a larger watershed, it's it's a, a, a Huck 8 or a Huck 10 watershed. So fairly large watersheds, about county size watersheds. Um, that's, that's coming soon. Um, you'll be able to uh, go to the uh, Data Ohio portal and start to search there. But that's not quite up and running yet. But we will be having all that data available publicly soon. We will be updating that information monthly um, as we go through. Um, in order to manage some of our workload, we decided that instead of having a live link that would be susceptible to getting hacked or anything else, we decided that it would be more than enough to update that monthly anyway. And at the end of the day, a soil and water board has to approve the payments. So it's it's kind of a monthly chug to get through those uh, data and get that updated file as well. Um, I talked a little bit about workload. And what I've got here is, uh, we worked with a consultant by the name of McKinsey back in 2019 and 2020 and developed a plan um, that would take us to a 40% reduction by 2025. It's a very aggressive plan. Um, you'll see the blue bars here. That was 
the BMP acres. So the amount of BMPs across the number of cropland acres that we would need to, to come close to that 40% reduction. And to date, if you look at what the plan has been versus what our sign up has been, we've been at or exceeding our overall plan. So that's very exciting. Um, you'll see a significant drop off in 24, 25. Um, that's because our, our contracts for the first 14 counties expire in 2023. We're looking at renewing or doing new enrollment in 2024, 25, and 26. We'll be doing that the latter half of next year. And you'll we'll see these numbers go back up. Hopefully, I hope we still have the interest in the program. So, um, but the overall workload um, with each one of these practices, we have a soil and water district. We have the producer that provides all the information, submits documentation. And then we have a soil and water district that reviews it and makes sure that the state of Ohio is getting what it pays for in delivering those practices. So the overall workload has been, has been tremendous. Are you doing I, I should know to, to the department because I think still, if the reduction of eight you know, portion of the is not really affected by the program, I, I should be very, very happy about the program because they're about to start using the program. So I guess I know why would they probably not continue the program. Are the incentives still going to be there? The incentives will still be there. Oh, sure. Uh, the question was, you know, overall, um, you know, if we're not seeing a drop in yield, um, you know, what would be, what would, why would the producers not be interested in the program? And, and the second part of the question was, was will the incentives still be there? Um, right now, the state of Ohio, second question first, the state of Ohio is going through their budget development process right now. Um, so uh, don't know, we don't know that the funds will be there for the 24, 25 fiscal year. There's no reason to believe that it wouldn't be there. Um, and overall coming from, coming from the governor's administration, coming from the legislature, we've seen strong support. So I would anticipate the funding will be there. Um, some of the challenges, in all honesty, to the program are the workload, and I'll get into that a little bit. We have learned a lot, and we have learned a lot about what we don't know in the last two years, and trying to make that overall system more efficient and more participant-friendly is probably where our focus has been. We have lost producers because the paperwork and the lag and the inconsistent message um, coming from ODA through a soil and water district to the producer, um, has, it's been a challenge. And, and we're working on that and I'll get into some of that right now. I think to that end and to your question, we're really looking at improving some of our program delivery technology. Um, we developed this program from November of 2019 and we rolled it out in February of 2020. So about a three month process. We put together our practices. We, we thought through those really good. We did all these other parts so that we know the incentive rates, this, that, and the other thing. We never gave one minute of time to how we're actually going to manage the program. So when I talk about 2,400 contracts, 100 producers per county on average at a soil and water district, while we thought about additional workforce in the district, we're managing every one of those contracts on paper. We're tracking them electronically, but if, if a producer comes in and says, I want to change from 100 acres of cover crop to 150 acres of cover crop, all of that tracking and all of that contract has to happen on paper. None of it is digital. So we're working hard to develop some software platforms that will help us take applications um, from producers in a digital format, whether that be from the producer developed in the soil and water conservation district or from a, from a consultant that's working with their producer on their fertility recommendations. We're working on that platform now. Um, that'll also build in the last thing you see I have there's communication and consistent communication. The other thing that we're doing with that software is we're building a lot of the program lo logic into the software. So you can't proceed to step two until you've satisfied step one. And that will really help give us a more consistent message across 24 counties. Because realistically, we've got, we've got ODA's team, which is me and five others at ODA that are managing this program, going out to 24 soil and water districts. Each one of those soil and water districts probably has three or four people working on the program. So we go from five people telling the story to 96 out to 2,400 producers and their supporting staff. 
if any of you've ever played telephone when you're kids, that message gets garbled as it goes through those different changes. So, so that's been the challenge. And we're, we're really looking at that software platform to help give us a more consistent message from ODA, from where the project goals are, all the way down to the producer and to the uh, consultants that are helping them. <clears throat> Any questions? Go ahead. Yes, um, the uh, I'm raised to all the manure management. I talked to Laura Johnson in September. The needle has not required the cost of nitrogen coming. And it hasn't been I'm you, but you guys have made changes. You made, um, during the conception of that in 2019, you had a planning and your policy was developed. Okay. Now, there's going to have to be changes made. There's also as what, what's your plan? Well, I'll, I'll tell you as far as the, yeah, the, the question is, is that we've, we've, we've seen where we got H2 Ohio programming out there started in 2021. For 2022, we haven't seen a significant change in the water quality data coming through Laura Johnson through Waterville. That's that's your question, correct? Yes. Um, this is what I'll say, and I don't have a perfect answer. But what I will say is this, is that from the time you look at nutrient supply to the field, Till they travel through the whole drainage system and get anywhere from 20 miles away to more than 100 miles away, there's a lag in response. There's a lag in response in the phosphorus that comes through and the nitrogen that comes through. If we look at what we've done with Grand Lake St. Mary's and the response that we've had in Grand Lake St. Mary's in the past 10 years, we are now starting to see in the past two or three years, we started to see a significant drop in the phosphorus load going into Grand Lake St. Mary's as well as the overall microcystin and algae blooms that we see in Grand Lake St. Mary's. So at this point, with what we know, I can say that there's a lag in the system. Now, beyond that, what's the backup plan? Um, I think, honestly, sir, I can't answer that question. That that's goes up to questions that go up into ODA's administration and to the governor's administration, to be perfectly honest. What I will say is, if we look at overall, if we look at the amount of manure that's generated in the watershed and that's used in the watershed, that manure is enough to fertilize maybe 20% of the cropland acres out there. The other 75 to 80% of the cropland acres out there are going to be receiving commercial fertilizer. And while manure is part of the problem, I think from my standpoint, we've got to recognize that commercial fertilizers that are 85% soluble compared to manure that might be might be 50% soluble, that fertilizer is probably a bigger part of this overall equation and solving it than what manure is individually. And I think that's, that's kind of where we're concentrating on. Once it's in the water, the algae, the microcystin, whatever, doesn't care whether it came from manure or from commercial fertilizer. And if we look at overall, there is a lot more tonnage of commercial fertilizer or phosphorus being delivered through commercial fertilizer than what's ever been delivered through manure. So, I, and that's what we're looking at. That science is still under development, but that's probably the best answer or the best answer to that question I can give you. Since the entire program is based on goals, a 40% reduction of phosphorus loading, the golf grass and fossils by 2025. All of these participants, their nutrient management plan must have prescribed goals. Is that correct? That is not written to a pres prescribed standard. Could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. We've got about 25 people on my um, so the question was, is since the whole program is based on a goal, a 40% nutrient reduction goal, does every one of those nutrient management plans focus in on a nutrient reduction goal as well? Correct. That's your question. And our plans are written on a standard that matches the nutrient requirement of the crop yield to what the soil has. So 
to answer your question, what we're really trying to do is take fields that are higher in soil test phosphorus that don't need fertilization and not put fertilizer on them. Um, that's probably the biggest part of where our goal is at now. And then within that, across manure and across the commercial fertilizer, we're trying to develop the science and the understanding of exactly how low can we push that phosphorus number and not sacrifice yield. Um, I think there's room to be gained there, but do I have the science, do I have the data to go up to a farmer and say, you can push your soil test levels lower and not, and not receive a drag on your yield and ultimately in, your income? No, I've got to, we are working on developing that. So to answer your question, the nutrient management plan is written to a standard and we're putting phosphorus on that's needed to get the yield out of the field. And if you look at overall, whether you look at manure nutrients, commercial fertilizers, and you look at soil tests that have been coming into the different labs from Northwest Ohio, for about the last uh, 14 or 15 years, we have seen a steady downward trend in the overall soil test phosphorus levels that are coming back in the soil test. So we're on the right path. Um, if we look at fertilizer sales across the ODA does not manage and look at those uh, sales across on watersheds. It's on a district. So if we look at the, uh, see if I can back up. See if I can get a decent map here. It'll help me explain what, what we're looking at. So if we look at uh, it's these 10 counties right up in here, the 10 counties in Northwestern Ohio, if we look at fertilizer sales from those counties, they have been on a downward trend since about 2002. To the, to the point now where if we look at overall phosphorus fertilizer sales in that 10 county area, we're off about 25 to 30% today in phosphorus sales from where we were in two, 2008, I think is the number. And I apologize, I'm going back on my memory, but we've seen a steady decline in the overall phosphorus application. So we started down this path, but, but it's the same challenge. We're not gonna see an immediate reaction within the system. The other part that's a challenge for us is when we start to look at the driver of the phosphorus loss, the driver of the nutrient loss, it comes back to that precipitation. And we have seen about a 35% increase in runoff coming out of the Maumee watershed in the last 30 years. So that's the other part of this that we're trying to understand how to better manage and how to better cope with, because it's not all just field management and, and fertilizers that, that are driving this. We've also got more rainfall, more runoff that we're dealing with today than we did 30 years ago. Do you have a feeling on the number of non-H2O enrolled crop, I'm sorry, crop acres that have an EMP? Do I have a few? Yeah. So the question is, do I have a feel or do we have a feel of, of how many cropland acres are out there that aren't enrolled in the program? Um, we do. Um, all the numbers that I'm reporting to you do not include any federal programming. So federal farm bill, CSP, um, CR, well, not CRP, but EQIP, all of those programs have, have similar practices that they're funding. The numbers that I'm reporting to you today don't include those. Um, we are working with NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, to build a platform where we can incorporate all of those. And then also, we're trying to work with uh, a group called the Ohio Agricultural Conservation Initiative, um, which is a group of, of commodity groups, environmental groups, to try to build a platform to understand what's happening voluntarily outside of any kind of a program, um, outside of any kind of payments or anything like that. That one's a tougher nut to crack. Um, the agricultural industry, by its very nature, is pretty conservative. Um, you know, don't want to have a whole lot of spotlight on them. And for those folks that don't participate in programs where we process the payments and say something happened, I think it's really difficult to track what's going on. But OACI through the commodity groups is trying to open up that line of communication with individual producers, with their clientele to say, hey, how can we report this stuff that's going on and get a, a fuller picture of everything across the board? So uh, that's a work in progress. And again, a lot of this is a work in progress. If, if we look at... Uh, 
if we look at my education, I graduated from engineering school in 94, 1994. And if we talked about controlling phosphorus in 1994, all the way up until about probably the mid 2000s, 2005, my answer to you in the conservation realm is if you wanna eliminate phosphorus loss, you eliminate erosion. So, so to eliminate that erosion, it's great. And you knock out the vast majority of phosphorus loss with eliminated erosion, but there's still that tiny little bit of dissolved reactive phosphorus that's jet fuel for algae. And we did not understand what the impact of that was until to be perfectly honest, coming into 2010, 2012, the first time spent 25 years in the conservation world, the first time I ever heard the term dissolved reactive phosphorus was in 2014, when I got pulled into to implementing some of the distressed watershed rules across Grand Lake St. Mary's. I had spent 20 years in the conservation world and I'm not up on everything and not saying that I am, but 2014 was the first time I ever heard of dissolved reactive phosphorus. So, so I, it's, a, it's a fairly young science and it's a fairly new understanding. And we're still trying to build that knowledge. Is it your intent in the near future to control the drainage of our farmland here in Northwest? Uh, the question was, is it our intent to control the drainage on farmland in Northwest Ohio? No, I, not from the Division of Soil and Water. And, and like I said, you know, our history and our, our background has been based firmly in conservation efforts and voluntary conservation efforts at that. I think there is need to have a better understanding of how to manage the system overall and be more effective with that. But to date, it's certainly not the interest of our division, and I have not heard any rumblings of, of trying to do that. And in all honesty, um, to start going down that road creates a lot of a lot of people and a lot of work that I don't even understand how we would start to attack. So in conjunction with that, I was in the program in the 1940. My degrees are graduated from the 1960s. But Dr. Shepard would say you have a good year. Invest in fertilizer and put the extra on the ground. Are you communicating with the ag retailer who is the end result of the loss of business to help administer the programs? In our district here in Wood County, we spend as much time educating the dealer to develop crop lifting plans as we do the farmers. And I think you left to understand how the communication change because they've got the people who know the people. They take the social change, whether it be red or not. And I think we need a better communication chain to the co-op, the independent, and the national fertilizer. Yeah, the, the question was what are the efforts to communicate with the, the ag retail industry, the consultants, um, the fertilizer applicators that are out there to bring them into the fold. And and I couldn't agree with you more. And to be perfectly honest, as I said, we developed H2 Ohio in such a short window. Um, we had conversations with, with the industry, with ag retail, but to say that they were meaningful, I would say if I told you that, I'd probably be a little bit dishonest um, with the speed with which we tried to develop the program. Um, going back and looking at Henry County, looking at Wood, uh, uh, Putnam, and looking at some of those other counties, if you look at Henry County specifically, and, and they, they saw into the future much better than we did at ODA, one of the first things they did with, with H2 Ohio was they started reaching out to their ag retailers because they saw the exact same thing that we did. We had a blind eye to it. Um, I think a big part of their success is early on in program rollout, they brought in their ag retailers, they explained what the program was, explained what we were trying to achieve, and they got buy-in from the ag retailers within the first 30 days of having a program rolled out. That's why they have success. Um, we are working through the Ohio Agribusiness Association to start building some more of those conversations. A lot of, in fact, I think we have a conversation scheduled for this morning where we're talking to ag retailers about what we're trying to do with some of the software to try to incorporate better nutrient management development and better delivery of their information into an H2Ohio application through a software platform called MyFarms. So 
we're building that we're building that uh, discussion. We're building that uh, conversation as we speak. Um, what I have seen coming from the ag industry, from the fertilizer industry, so I think we've got a lot of folks that are looking at the overall business model and saying we're going to have to change away from some of this application focused services to get to to make our profit to keep our business running. Um, so we are seeing that reaction in the in the industry as well. So, but again, uh, I would say our first thing out of the gate, we missed that one by a mile. And I, I won't, I won't try to say that we did because we did. Um, I think we're trying to pull that, those folks in um, through OABA, through the 4R partnership, and through some of the discussions that we're fostering through the districts to their local um, fertilizer folks and, and uh, ag retailers. So, but it's a work in progress, like all of this is. It is a work in progress. We, again, we learned a lot of things that we didn't know. We are about we are getting over our time. Uh, all right, everybody. Um, we're going to take a couple more questions here, but I just want to say thank you to the online audience. If you want to drop off, um, we are. This will be our last uh, ag forum until next year. We really appreciate Terry coming in and taking all these questions, and we'll stick around for a couple more minutes if you can take the questions. But anybody who wants to drop off, thank you for your time today, and we'll be having some information coming out to you for our next one next spring. Thank you. My question is, um, how do you measure the success or failure of the program? I don't think about measuring that. Are you measuring through the water test? We are. We've got several efforts that are going on. And, and uh, the question was, is how are we measuring success of the program? Are we engaged with universities to look at how we do this? At the end of the day, long term, Waterville is going to be, Waterville will be our, our gauge. Um, in the meantime, um, we are working with um, the Agricultural Research Service and Kevin King to make a better connection between the best management practices that we have developed and we're implementing and trying to derive what that means at the edge of the field for nutrient reduction. Now, edge of the field means where that water drops out of the field into the ditch. And then, as like I said, there is a lag that goes down through the rest of the drainage network. Most of our knowledge when we look at implementing a best management practice and trying to and decipher what kind of nutrient load reduction that accomplishes when we look at phosphorus specifically it's all on total phosphorus because our history our knowledge going back 30 years is based mm -hmm. on sediment so what we're working with kevin king with, through his through his edge of field network is building a better understanding of those practices and what kind of dissolved reactive phosphorus reductions they'll deliver. That is a challenge because we can look at every different soil type for the same practice, even if it has the same soil test level in the field, different soil tests will impact what that is. So not only are we working with them on the research to understand what the edge of field impact of that practice is on that field, but then also working with some researchers from the University of Kentucky to then say, okay, here's the data that we have. How can we extrapolate that across the 4 million acre watershed and understand in general what the impact is, regardless of where we apply that, that, uh, that practice at. So how do you measure the phosphorus <clears throat> in Lake Erie after we spend 85 million? How do we measure that it actually worked keeping the phosphorus out of Lake Erie? I think that's something that's under development. And that's what I'm trying to say is I don't know that we have the science or the technology to truly do that at this point. Everything that we're doing right now is going to be based on modeling. All the information that's out there that shows that's that's made a prediction that we got to do this to achieve that reduction has been based on modeling. And I will tell you that when it comes into the modeling world, when we're looking at this dissolved reactive phosphorus animal specifically, the true science out there is very, very limited. And most of it comes from across Canada and across the US does not necessarily relate to our heavy high clay soils that are glaciated that we have here in Northwest Ohio. So for me, you asked about measuring success. For me, the first step in measuring success is to continue down that reduced phosphorus application road. That's something that we can measure. That's something that we can understand. I think continuing to challenge the soil test phosphorus levels that we are recommending in the soils and see if we can push those lower, which me personally, I think we can. 
I think that's going to be a measurement of success. Um, and those are things that we can measure. I think if we continue to look at soil test results coming out of the labs and continue to see reduced soil test levels in the soil tests that are coming through labs, I think that's another measure of our success. Those measurements, though, are not something that happens and you're not going to see significant movement year by year. We have spent 30 or 40 years getting to the point that we are today within Lake Erie, within the Miami watershed. To think that we're going to change it drastically over two or three years is setting up everybody for disappointment because I don't see that as being a possibility. So, I, and I wish I had a better answer. Unfortunately, I do not. Yeah, my portion here. So, thank you guys. All right, guys. Um, online folks, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. We appreciate you joining today again. Thank you, Tim, and we'll see you all next year. Thank you. What communications are you having? Market.